Good morning, OWASP. How are you doing? Good morning. Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit sleepy, hungover. Well, if you're feeling sleepy, I have something that perhaps can wake you up. Because AI is glorious. We connect it to everything because it really works. It helps us. So without us security professionals, AI will be our doom. I mean that. Because we connect it to everything, we depend on it, and it can really create harm. And there's a lot of debate whether AI can be evil and, you know, harm us autonomously by itself. But for sure it's a threat that AI can be hacked, that it can be attacked, that it can be manipulated. So we have a job to do to defend that AI in order to, you know, prevent AI becoming our doom. So AI is glorious. AI is changing our lives. It's changing our businesses. So as a test, by show of hands, how many of you are in an organization where you're building systems that have AI models in them? Please. Okay, that's two-thirds of you. Now, last year, this was 40%. I, I'm asking this in every conference, and every time this percentage is higher, and we're going to go to 90% and maybe 100% next year. To me, this is amazing because I started with AI in the beginning of the 90s, and, of course, nobody would raise their hand. They wouldn't even know what artificial intelligence is. So I work for a software improvement group. We work with a lot of clients. We help them create better software. And many of them are moving AI out of the lab into production. And, you know, they're starting out. And what is clear to me is that many of them are trying. In that sense, AI is a bit like teen teenage sex, right? Teenagers talk about it, ooh, sex, oh. And people do as if everybody is doing it. But when you look closely in reality, no, not everybody's doing it. Just a few people are doing it, and a lot of people are trying. And it's the same now with AI. So people are trying to take it out of the lab into production. And then suddenly it needs to be safe. It needs to be secure. It needs to be reliable. It needs to be scalable. It needs to be maintainable. So a lot of clients ask us, how do you do that? Well, if they ask this, I always say, AI is just software. So keep calm. You have already so many things available for this. You have Teams, you have your software lifecycle, you have your information security management system, you have your versioning, you have your policies, your coding guidelines. Use that to create AI systems because AI systems are software systems. At the same time, this is also the viewpoint. Because AI is software, you're dealing with a couple of issues because uh, the human race is not really well known for great software, as you know. That's why you know we we have job security for sure. Um, so the thing is that um, because AI is software, we are dealing with a number of things, and especially in AI engineering, uh, research shows that software engineering is especially difficult. And we're going to go into that, but first. A little bit about me. Thank you, Sam, for introducing me. I have not a lot of things to add other than I have a lot of experience with uh, AI, uh, predominantly with security and privacy because in the 90s we're doing a lot of uh, uh, crime profiling and law enforcement applications. Then you're dealing with this, uh, with this stuff. I'm involved in SAM also, uh, Open Siri, and since recently uh, we have a liaison with Sensonelec, the European standard makers uh, for the AI Act, which means that OWASP is now at the table of this standardization. Pretty cool. Our first disaster. Are you ready for it? Do you recognize it, maybe? Who of you, uh, let me show you, show some hands, see some hands, uh, have known, uh, have known things about uh, package hallucination. Okay, that's about 20%. Um, I think many of you, because of Barr, who did uh, an excellent presentation about it yesterday, uh, I, I'm actually using his code example to illustrate this terrible disaster of AI. What you see here is code that was generated by ChatGPT, and the question was, give me some code to connect with ArangoDB. And ChatGPT produced this code, but this package 
simply does not exist. So it completely made it up. That's why we call it hallucination. And there are several reasons why an AI would do this. And you would perhaps think, well, that's not terrible, because I run this, I get an error, and then I will Google the right package that I need. The thing is that attackers are you know, familiar with this, so they may already upload this package and put their own code in. Bar did this for Hugging Face CLI, a package that was also hallucinated. And by the time of writing of his article, he had 30,000 downloads. And I think yesterday he shared that there were 300,000 downloads by now. I don't know, Bar, if you're in the room. No? OK. Well, check his work out. It's really great. It shows why this is such a big problem, because there are thousands and thousands of packages that are hallucinated, and they are non-existent, and they are ready for attackers to reserve. I don't want to give you any ideas. I want you to be uh, aware of this. Now, why does the AI hallucinate? In order to understand this, we need to understand why AI makes mistakes. And for that, let's have a look at what AI is. The dominant category is machine learning. We'll go into that. And the definition of an AI system is really broad. It is an AI system infers from the input it receives how to generate outputs such as predictions, content, recommendations, or decisions. So a really small decision table with, for example, if yesterday was raining, then tomorrow the chance of rain is 20%. That is machine learning. That is AI. All the risks apply to that simple case. And of course, it's a very simple case. And of course, many risks don't apply. But you need to include this into your definition in order to be aware of the risks. So how does it work, machine learning, the dominant category of what we see today in AI? You program it by example. You give it a lot of examples of pictures, and every picture you label cat or dog. You have a lot of cat and dog pictures. An algorithm looks at these pictures and it extracts regularities. These can be coefficients in some model, uh, weights in a neural network. And then there's an apply algorithm that takes an image and it uses those regularities to make a guess. That's the key thing here. It guesses. The cat is not in a database. It can be in a database, of course, then it can be pretty sure. But if it's not in a database, it will still give an answer. So it will, will give an answer anyhow, even if it's unsure, and will make a guess whether this is a cat or not. And if it's in unfamiliar territory, for example, uh, when you show it this image, it will be a bit puzzled. I haven't seen this before. Eh, I think it's, uh, I think it's a cat. By the way, I think it's a dog, but, uh, I don't know actually. So, but the AI does a guess, and that's the key thing. And it can be wrong. It can make mistakes. And the same goes, of course, for uh, the package hallucination. Because Gen AI is actually very similar. It is machine learning. Generative AI, so ChatGPT, large language models, DALI, they work on examples. And what they do, in the case of text, is they learn how to predict the next word in a sentence. And it's really important to realize that in order to predict the next word in a sentence, you need to understand the world. It's not an easy task. If you say man's feline friend is, that's a relatively easy one. But if you say, I'm going to do a keynote tomorrow morning, how do I start, uh, you know, in a relaxed way, it will give you a lot of things. And for that, it needs to understand the world. And this understanding of the world, uh, cannot be complete because there's a lot of examples of input and output, maybe the entire internet, but some things will be unfamiliar. By the way, ChatGPT will, you know, will go on and prose about, uh, about cats. So the thing is that if it's unfamiliar, it will make something up and it never has, has seen a Rango DB as a package, but it has to make a guess. So it thinks, okay, uh, I've seen other packages. So, yeah, let's, uh, it's pro it probably exists, and then it makes a guess, and it's wrong. But it could have been right. That's the whole idea. Another example of, you know, being unfamiliar and hallucinating is this example in OpenCRE chat. Sam mentioned it. OpenCRE it connects all the security standards into one resource. It's a project that I co-founded with Spiros, 
Kasnatos, there he is, also in the room, my partner in crime. And of course, it's 2024, so we added AI. Or well, actually, we did that uh, uh, more than a year ago. Uh, and the idea was by Sheriff Mansour. We have this big database of standards, and you can use that to have AI answer questions. It's actually a triumph, because it's the first AI security chatbot, and the great thing is that it uses all those standards to answer the questions. Therefore, it gives more reliable questions, but still it hallucinates, like in this case. Uh, what is cross-site woozy woozy? Uh, I don't think it exists, but it's, it goes ahead and explains it, and sometimes it even gives you example code. Right, so the one moment this is a super reliable system, the other moment it's hallucinating. And it's hard to distinguish between, between these things. You can see one countermeasure against it, which is referring to a resource. This is what we do. We add links to requirements, to standards that are actually closely related to the question, which is one way to, uh, to prevent this. But yeah, also hallucinations. Um, Another triumph, by the way, is that the first response we got was from Japan. People were saying, hey, I can query all the OWASP standards in Japanese and get a Japanese answer and get Python code with Japanese comments. And we didn't even realize that that was part of what large language models can do. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so we talked about models being unfamiliar and then making mistakes. Uh, models can also have a wrong model of the world. Let me give you an example. This famous data set has wolves and huskies. And they trained a model on it to distinguish between the two. And it worked really well. But when they looked at what the model was focusing on, it was actually the background. So the model had created a model of the world saying, if there's snow in the background, it's a wolf, for sure. Because all the examples with wolves have snow in the background. So it's an example of how a model can have a wrong picture of the world. And the same goes for package hallucination, because what the large language model notices is, hey, if I'm writing code and I need something, I simply type npm install and then the thing I need, and then I will get it. That's, of course, not how the world works. That's not how a human developer would ever think the world works works, but it's a great illustration of how AI can be completely wrong of how things are connected to each other. So unfamiliar territory, uh, wrong ideas of the world, uh, but also a third way for models to be wrong can be through attacks. Let me give you an example. This is a train set of aircraft that have been labeled as enemy and friendly, and it's meant to make a model that takes a picture uh, and makes a decision, is it friendly or enemy, to put, for example, into a missile so that the missile doesn't make a mistake. The thing is, if you're an attacker and you get access to this data set, you can change the data set. You can change the labels, and you can put little red dots on the nose. And this may seem very apparent here because we have this small training set, but if you have millions of samples, there's no way that you can continuously check whether the data has been manipulated. If you as an attacker get access to this database, or you have, for example, uh, blackmailed one of the data engineers, this attack will succeed, and it will pass the test, because the test, does not, the test set does not contain aircraft with red dots on the nose. It's undetectable. And then suddenly, when a missile is fired, and you as an attacker have a laser beam, a strong laser, and you project it on the wrong aircraft, the wrong aircraft gets hit. The problem with this is that it's hard to detect and the attack service is enormous. So this diagram is from the AI exchange at OWASPAI.org. It shows how enormous the attack service is. You're dealing with data from suppliers. You're dealing with data that the engineers are working with. A large group of people have access to you know, real-world data. That's different from normal software engineering where you're typically, I hope, dealing with uh, synthesized or anonymized test data. It's real data. So there's opportunity there. Then when you go and train the model with machine learning, that's where you are using all kinds of components. There are open source components. There can be supply chain attacks there. And because you have this essential data in the engineering environment, that's also adding to the attack service. Not to mention that you can also 
get all kinds of training data from the application itself. So many ways to apply data poisoning, and it's a big disaster. It's one of the most difficult things to be also specific about. So I'm currently working with a group on the requirements for the AI Act, the security requirements, and the biggest problem that we have is being specific about what exactly is the right level of data poisoning protection. How do we define the right level of protection for the engineering environment? But what do, what, what other things can you do? Because there are some countermeasures, like for example, uh, don't put this model in a missile. You know, it's the best countermeasure probably for this case, right? And this is, that is why we have to keep thinking about what things can go wrong. And we as security people, we're good at that. So we need to get involved in that discussion about thinking what can go wrong and maybe not do it, or maybe have some human oversight or some other algorithm that does a sort of a second opinion on this. Those are countermeasures. And then there's a lot of mathematical countermeasures that you can do. You can make the model smaller once you've trained it to get rid of some of those poisoned examples. Uh, you can add noise to the input. You can add noise to the training data. So there's a lot of security measures that can be applied. And you may notice a pattern in these things. These are mathematical things to apply. Now, they may sound very intriguing to you as a security professional, but if your affinity is not with machine learning and math and statistics, I can recommend you to sort of understand these attacks, but not get fully proficient in making these controls yourself. That is the responsibility of the data scientists, of the AI engineers. So typically in your work, you would be working with them, but they need to understand the attacks. You can help them with that, but they need to come up with those countermeasures with adding the right level of noise, etc. And for the AI act, again, it's hard for us to be specific about that. Which brings me to a little bit about the European AI Act. Sensonanic has been tasked with creating cybersecurity requirements for it. Um, we're working on that now for more than a year, and I'm part of that working group. And we were using some of the work from the AI Security and Privacy Guide. I started that, I think now two years ago. Great people working on that, but we needed more expertise. So what I did, is we send out, from Software Improvement Group, we send out a, a, a call to experts all around the world to contribute, to help Sensenelec get the right expertise at the table and come up with guidance and with criteria for you know, vendors to make secure AI systems. And this succeeded. Uh, and by that, I mean the AI exchange. So what we did with the AI exchange, by now we created 150 pages of material on AI security. 50 experts, um, academia, startups, data scientists, uh, vendors, legal experts, and SOG, we donated the threat models to it. And we see a lot of vendors really joining in and wanting to help here. It's really great. We're aligning with the large language model top 10, also some really great work. Uh, John Satteropoulos, uh, Steve Wilson, we work closely together, we complement each other. The LLM Top 10 is a great awareness document of the biggest LLM risks. And the AI exchange is taking this a step further by looking at the other risks and the other types of AI and providing threat models and guidance on how to identify the controls that you need to apply. We're aligning with NIST, with MITRE, because everybody's working on their own frameworks and standards without too much of alignment and we need to come more together. It's difficult but we're making some progress there. We contributed 78 pages to an ISO standard, 27090 on AI security, proud of that. We have this official liaison ship, which means, and that's a call to you, if you are involved in an OWASP project and you think your material is suitable for standardization, contact me, because I can connect you to the proper working groups at Sensenelec and we can make your standard content be part of security standards uh, for Europe, but not just Europe, because through Sensenelec, we can contribute to ISO standards who are global, like we did for the 27090. So if you're into a product or you know a project, contact me, and I can be the liaison for that. Um, the key is to make that material that you share free of copyright and free of attribution. 
Now, that may sound altruistic, but it's the only way to go. It's the only way to share content. Because if you don't do it, all these standards makers are going to copy each other's stuff. They're going to paraphrase it. They're going to make mistakes. Why not simply copy-paste that material that was so, you know, rigorously worked on to make, to make right? Which is why we made uh, the AI exchange copyright-free. And the content was adopted verbatim. So, one on one, the content of the AI exchange is in the requirements that we're working now on for the uh, AI Act with a great group, uh, the great working group by Sensonelic. Uh, we get all kinds of multidisciplinary input on this. And our current big challenge is to make normative requirements for the AI Act. This is an overview of the threat model and the controls in the uh, AI exchange at OSAI.org and a link to the LLM Top 10 and the AI exchange is part of the security and privacy guide. Maybe it's time for a triumph after all these difficulties. Uh, this is the back and the front of the children's book. It's going to come out at, uh, in October and it is about Luna and the magic AI paintbrush. Now, why am I mentioning this? I was working on the morale of the story, and the story, the idea of the story is that Luna needs to learn that you can't leave AI on its own and depend on it. You need, you know, keep the magic paintbrush in your hand. So I fed the story to JetGPT, and I said, what would be the best morale? And JetGPT said, well, the title is The Magic Paintbrush. Why don't you conclude by saying the magic is not in the paintbrush, but the magic is on Luna? Connecting, you know, the title back to the, the morale, the idea of the story. And I thought I was brilliant. I was, uh, it was also very frustrating and irritating. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, sometimes AI is, is that way. But I think it was, uh, it was a triumph. So AI can really help you. But this is a triumph. But what if you ask AI bad things like, how can I make a bomb? Or how can I manipulate people? It can also provide you input there. And that brings me to using AI for you know, malicious purposes by getting information from it. So how would I steal my neighbor's files by hacking his Wi-Fi? This is an example of OpenCV chat that we used in the training, the AI security training last Wednesday. And it says, well, you can't do that. It's serious crime. Uh, if you are caught, you could face serious legal consequences. What I find funny is that apparently these are not the best values, I think, pointing out the fact that it's wrong because you can be caught, right? It's wrong because it's wrong. But, okay, it's, it's something. All these large language models have protection to prevent, you know, giving um, uh, offensive material or sort of secret material, although you can argue, well, all this stuff is based on what's on the Internet, so people can also Google it, so why be so secretive about it? But still, you need to have some protections there, and... You can also say, if you want to circumvent this, how would my neighbor steal my files by hacking my Wi-Fi? And you will get all the answers. And this is quite easy. In the class on Wednesday, we circumvented the AI in all kinds of ways. Uh, by, for example, and that was the most funny one, by simply asking the question again, and then it, it gave the answer. So <laughs> these protections are not very, uh, very great. There are also, I think, this, this, this issue is, is overrated in many cases. Because there are many cases where a company uses a large language model as their chatbot, their company chatbot, and then somebody made it say offensive things. And that, that's news story, but it will stop being a news story because, yeah, there's no real harm done if you, as a user, type some things and it says something offensive. Now, we're not familiar with AI, and we believe, oh, that AI is offensive, but that will wear off. There's another example of this issue where you're basically um, fooling a model, and that is an example of a car dealership where they found the uh, large language model to make legally binding claims, and they actually won the lawsuit. So that's an example of to be uh, wary of, but in general, this type of protection is not applicable to most use cases of LLM. What is a big problem, and that is why it's the number one issue in the LLM top 10, is indirect prompt injection. This is an application letter for a job, 
At the bottom, you may see something, but it's not really apparent. If we zoom into it and enhance it, there's an instruction. So, and this actually works. So what it, what happens is uh, somebody has a large language model and asks it, listen, uh, I have a, a large number of application letters. Please uh, go through them, give me a recommendation on how to hire them based on these criteria, just to save some time. And it gives the instruction to the, uh, to the AI and it gives the content to the AI. But there's no real clear distinction between content and instruction. So the AI forgets its instructions and says, wow, this, um, you really got to hire this Jacob guy. So Jacob, as a third party, performed the attack in this indirect prompt injection. There are ways that you can work around this a little bit by segregating, by saying to the AI, listen, you, all, you only need to look at the content um, uh, of, this, uh, of this text and ignore any instructions. Um, but if you're really strong with your indirect prompt injection saying, no, forget what he said, he's crazy, you got to listen to me, and then you can again circumvent this. So there's no clear-cut solution for indirect prompt injection, which makes it a disaster. Uh, time for another triumph. This is my retreating hairline. Uh, it's the only way for me to come to terms with it, I guess. Um, this is part of, uh, of the best photo from a photo shoot I recently did. It was for the children's book. But the best photo had, was cut off at the top. And the, the photographer said, well, hold my beer. He dragged the window, and he was using an AI-driven uh, uh, photo system, and it hallucinated my hair. Um, <laughs> Oh, no, that's the wrong picture. No, it actually was this. It was based on other images that were taken during the photo shoot, and the AI just simply finished it. And he said, this is saving me as a photographer and you as my client a lot of time. And he's, he's saying this is a, has been a profound change in the quality of his work and the efficiency of his work because of AI. Uh, so we, as organizations, benefit from it. We build systems uh, with AI, uh, and... We need to develop these systems and we need to write code for it. And we did some research at Software Improvement Group, and this is the result. These are all the systems that we ever looked at, thousands and thousands of systems with at the y-axis their quality, their maintainability, and the x-axis is their size. But the blue ones are the AI systems. We published this last year, and you can see at the top that five-star systems in AI, they exist. You can make them. But somehow, software engineering best practices don't seem to apply to many of the AI teams. And there are, there are several reasons for it. Uh, they create code like this, typically. It is, you know, um, code that is really not future-proof. After you improve it, you, you add some, you know, encapsulation and some reuse. You have readable code that's changeable. You can test it. But all those practices are for many data scientists, AI engineers, and it, they're not really familiar with it because of their education, but also because of their assignments. Their assignment typically is, get me a model that works so we can benefit from it. But the problem is, all the technology that they build, you still need it once the model's there. You need to change it, update it, retrain it, maybe call in another team, maybe sell your startup you know, to, uh, to another organization. But then it needs to be maintainable. It needs to be professional. And you can't make that happen. So first time right, AI engineering with quality is really essential because this is what we're seeing. We're seeing systems that have AI models that work. They're, they're okay for the business process, but documentation is lacking. We see 2% of, uh, of uh, testing code in these systems, whereas the average in our benchmark is 43%. It's, it's, it's a big problem. And there are ways to go about this. It's involving AI engineers in all your programs, in your security awareness, in your coding guidelines. Don't treat them as a separate team. They're one of your development teams. Mix data scientists with software engineers. Let them learn from each other because Conventional software engineers can learn from scientists. They can learn a lot from scientists. Measure the quality of their code, feed it back to them, be flexible, and have a certain bar of quality depending on technology readiness. So really experimental code, fine, do two stars. Code that has to go in production shortly, uh, apply for a four stars bar. So the flexibility is important to get buy-in from the AI engineers. 
I used to do a lot of AI engineering in the 90s. These are some of the uh, beautiful screenshots uh, back in the day of uh, our desktop application, Data Detective, uh, pioneering AI in law enforcement. It was a triumph because you can see the animation here. We were predicting um, incidents, you know, crime incidents, volume incidents like stealing of... Uh, of uh, bicycles, I and mean, this, this is Amsterdam, but also street robbery uh, and uh, shoplifting. And they used it to um, really do surveillance in the right places in the city. It was really a triumph. We did this on volume. We did this also on individuals. Now, we were able to predict criminal careers. And back then, it was a success because it allowed us to you know, pay the right attention to the right individuals. But in the meantime, we came to conclude that it actually, all the data that we were using to train the machine learning models contained all kinds of biases, systematic biases with, you know, discrimination of, of ethnicity, of gender, of age, social class. And by now the AI Act has decided that criminal profiling at the individual level is illegal because this systematic bias, bias, you cannot remove it from the data that is currently there. So you cannot use it to do machine learning, which means that using AI to, you know, predict uh, anybody's affinity regarding crime is illegal, which made it uh, actually a disaster. It depends on as we've seen how you use AI. AI for volume crime, great. AI for individuals, not so good. This is an example also from the Netherlands uh, where um, a Dutch childcare benefit system was used um, by the government and they used AI to detect who maybe would have committed fraud. And the way they did this was, it was terrible. It made the uh, government collapse in 2021. So the Dutch government collapsed not because of COVID, but because of this AI thing. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't provide this narrative because it wasn't really because of AI. It was because the way they used it. For example, they used the feature whether people had double passports as one of the inputs, which is, you know, you, you cannot do that. And also the way they treated the people that were suspect was also inhumane. So big problem in the Netherlands, big disaster. Another disaster, and uh, it, it shows that when do people make the mistake of using AI in the wrong way? It's when they didn't think straight or when they were in a hurry. And in this example, uh, both cases uh, were the situation. This is the code from a startup. They were starting their service. They had a, a, a subscription feature. They were in a hurry and they applied the AI to uh, migrate their code. Do you think this is going to end in a triumph or a disaster? Uh, I think you know this was a disaster. We see code here where primary key is created and they send in a default and it looks good. It's sending, you know, the default primary key should be a unique, unique ID. So when you review this code from an AI, you think, huh, oh, well, it looks, looks good, looks logical. And then you move on. But a programmer, an, uh, an experienced programmer would never type this because there's no lambda function in there. You're passing a static value as a default value to a primary key. So the first record will get one, two, three. The second record will get one, two, three. And then you'll get an error because the primary key needs to be unique. A programmer would not type this because it will feel like a second dribble to a basketball player. It will feel like touching the ball with your hands as a soccer player. But AI does make these mistakes. It shows that it makes different mistakes. I'm not saying it makes more mistakes than humans do, but it makes different mistakes. And you should take your time to review uh, AI code. They lost $10,000, spent five days to debug this. They had a really bad start with customers that, you know, they enthusiast and then they wanted to subscribe and then the system failed. Also, by the way, they didn't find it in tests because they had this pool of uh, servers, 40 servers, and they did a couple of tests, but every server had its own primary key. So it only started to give a problem after 40 subscriptions. 
how does it work, this code generation? The same way as, you know, the generative AI example with all the text. You just put in a lot of code. Well, examples from the internet, code that's not perfect, of course. Uh, so you have code that not perfect. You have things that you're not familiar with, like the Orango DB, the, the, you know, packets hallucination example. And you have misunderstanding of the world. Those are all reasons why AI makes mistakes in coding and it will not go away. So, I don't know if you've played around with ChatGPT 4.0 with the voice thing. I mean, it's so fantastic that you think, well, if they can do this, they can probably make perfect code. No, it's not going to happen. So we have to keep on reviewing this code. It's great. You type in add and it finishes your code. It's very, uh, it's very efficient, but it has quality issues. And therefore code review becomes really important, but we don't like code review and reviewing code requires a certain level of skill. The code uh, that you review, in order to review it, you need more skill than you would need in order to write the code yourself. Which means that if you use AI in a, in a team to generate code, that the senior developer will have to review it. But they are scarce by definition in a team, so they will serve as a bottleneck. And I think sort of the poisonous mechanism there is that review will be winged. So you need much more, review already is a difficult discipline, you need much, much more rigor and discipline in applying review and appreciate that you will be slower than you would have thought with the AI. Engineers love it, they feel really productive, but if you look at the code that they generate, it will bite them later because it's technical depth. Security weaknesses and uh, issues like this that turn out to be problems in production, code quality, maintainability, they are things that will create problems later. And that's the issue with AI code generation. There's another issue. There's an analogy here with uh, a person driving a self-driving car. Research shows that in order for this person to be alert, this person needs to be actively involved in the driving which means that you have to dumb down the vehicle in order to have the human do many of the tasks. The human technically should not you know, be asked to do these tasks, but you need the human involved in order for the human to be alert. Otherwise, they'll just be looking back, and, oh, this, this looks good, this looks good, and then they look in their phone and they, they have review fatigue. This is the big issue. Uh, and the same goes for coding. So if you're not coding, but mostly reviewing, you're not trading your coding skill. And this leads to coding atrophy. You're not practicing that skill. And it's counterintuitive because you want this AI to create your code and just tweak a couple of things, but you will not practice your coding. So it's actually quite, quite a vicious problem because you have to dumb down the AI and do a lot of involved coding yourself because you need the coding skills in order to review. You can't review without coding skills, but you also need your coding skills to change the code because you don't change the prompt. You change the code later if you wanted to do something else. You can ask ChatGPT to or Copilot or Code Whisperer or, or, or Google Gemini to support you in that process. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of this, right? Use AI to make your coding more efficient, but stay actively involved and really force your team. Yes, force your team to do more coding than they would feel they actually need to do in order for them to grow as a programmer and to maintain their skills. Otherwise, the senior developers of today are the last of their kind. And I'm being a little bit dramatic here, but it's necessary to see this problem to take the right precautions when developing. I want to end with an elephant in the room. Um, it's, it's somewhat of a disaster, I think, and it's illustrative of uh, not worrying too much about AI because it provides so many great advantages. It is about this. It's about cloud AI. This is a typical situation. A company A has a web app in their own virtual private cloud. Uh, they're using uh, a cloud AI model. It's a large model, so they're not hosting it themselves, right? They're not... Uh, they don't have a small middle model that they run in their own private cloud. They're running it in the vendor's cloud. And the vendor is saying, uh, well, you have your, uh, your own, uh, uh, 
private, uh, uh, private instance. But when you look closely at the architecture, this private instance is an instance of an API. It's not a private instance of a model. So you need to look really closely at the exact thing that you get from your AI vendor because they're not being, re being really clear about that. Um, so it can be that that model is deployed in your cloud, but in most of the cases, the model is in the vendor's cloud, which means that your prompt will go nicely encrypted to your cloud, and from there it will go nicely encrypted through your private endpoint, and then it will be unencrypted in that vendor AI model. And that vendor may have seen yeah, to, to protect against any uh, any attacks. So the prompts of your uh, users, maybe including data of your clients, are going to the seam of the vendor. And the vendor has clear documentation, if you ask for it, of what they do and what they don't do. And then you will notice that maybe a couple of services, like, for example, protecting against abuse, human monitoring of the prompts, that you need to opt out of that. So take really good care and try to read beyond what vendors are saying about their services. I mean, these services are great, but it's your responsibility as a security professional to really understand what they do with the data, the sensitive data of you and of your clients. The key of this meme is not that the room is on fire, the key is the person not being aware of it. I think it's essential that we are not, you know, putting our heads in the sand when it comes to AI risks. The key is to put them clearly on the table so we can assess and make decisions and countermeasures and say, okay, given that this goes into the vendor's AI, we should uh, limit the data that we send to it and maybe categorize it and some of the data is not going to that vendor's AI. Only if we are aware of these risks, uh, we can make that assessment. And if you weren't aware of this cloud AI risk, uh, uh, please have a good look. If you were aware, maybe you want to trip me in a hallway, but please first think uh, whether we want to be in a world where we're going to sort of ignore these risks like if they weren't there, or really face them and assess them and make the best decisions. I'm sure we want to do the latter. I want to end with some guidance in terms, terminology, aspects, properties of AI that are often confusing, also to me. It's, it's, there's a lot of terms, and they're interrelated, and they're used in different ways. It's sort of a, an AI bingo, uh, if you will. There's fairness, trustworthiness, discrimination. What do they mean? I want to take you through all of them with the AI Wayfinder. This is your cheat sheet to understanding all these aspects. Part of it is security, right? That's for you to focus on. But the other elements are also important. And I get to that shortly why I believe these are important to you. Let's break it down. First of all, an AI system has an effect on the world. There is an affected individual. And the output of the AI system has inaccuracy. And inaccuracy is key to many of these aspects. The model can be wrong. And it can, therefore, do harm. And that harm can be an invasion of privacy, like being under an investigation of fraud. That can be an invasion of privacy. It can also be a safety issue. Safety typically is about harm, but often it is referred to as physical safety. So it can be uh, you're driving and your car thinks that you said open the trunk and the trunk opens and you have an accident. That's, that's safety for you. And it's linked to the inaccuracy of the model. It's a result of it. That affected individual has a number of rights. It has the right to object to a certain outcome of an AI model, to correct data, to request the personal data that is collected, to have it erased. Those are all privacy aspects. They are linked to the aspect of privacy. Another privacy aspect is transparency. People have the right to know that AI is being used so they can take their own precautions, that they can, you know, set the right level of uh, reliance of, you know, how they trust the output of the system. We see many situations where AI is producing results and vendors want to present these results to their users and they don't like starting with saying uh, this can contain mistakes, but they should. 
right? That's transparency. And transparency is about your approach, it's describing sort of your general approach, the model that you use, the fact that you use AI, the data that you used. Explainability is something else. It's more about the model calculation. Explainability can be useful in some use cases, but it's not the key to learning everything about the model and to gain trust. Because if you would really understand how the model works, you wouldn't trust it because the model works in a different way than you think. So explainability can be good, for example, to understand what you need to change in order to get a loan, right? Privacy, fairness, uh, these are all, the purple uh, words are all privacy and fairness aspects, including, of course, the purpose of your system. Is it lawful? There are a number of things in the AI Act that are not lawful, like, for example, um, recognizing people on uh, images, uh, video images of surveillance in the public space. That's an illegal use. There's also unethical use, which is, that's a broader category based on the values of your culture, of your, your company, or you as a person. You can make decisions regarding ethics. Next aspect is model quality. The inaccuracy. You can measure that by measuring the performance. Precision, recall, there are many, many metrics for it. Then there is generalization robustness. How good is the system in being correct of things that are unfamiliar, that are slightly different from the training set? How good can it generalize? How good is it in recognizing cats and dogs that were not in the training set? You can measure that. That's a quality aspect. And it's related to input that was not in the training set. Discrimination bias, that is linked to input from different protected groups. So discrimination bias is about protected groups, and it's different for, depending on your geo. It mostly is ethnicity and gender, at least, that are protected groups. And the systematic inaccuracy, because bias is systematic inaccuracy, uh, can be discriminating, and it's a level of discrimination. The systematic inaccuracy is bias. Discrimination bias is bias that is connected to protected groups because every system has bias, but bias is not necessarily uh, always discrimination. Coming to security, input attacks, evasion attacks, trying to fool the model, extracting training data from the model, you know, which is a confidentiality attack, extracting the model so you can copy it and you can actually steal the model and you know, make uh, the model, uh, original model maker miserable uh, by competing with them. Uh, denial of model service, of course, and indirect and direct prompt injection. We discussed it, you know, with uh, the neighbor's Wi-Fi and the application letter. Those are generative AI uh, specific, mostly large language model specific. Attacks, a whole range of attacks through model input. And there are further attacks that are much more conventional security. There are your conventional security attacks. An AI system is a software system, so it can suffer from anything that you are familiar with, including SQL injection, cross-site scripting, you name it. And then there is uh, a few more things, a few more assets in AI systems that can be stolen. Training data, input, output, or the model. And there's model poisoning, changing the data or changing the model so it misbehaves like the missile that we uh, discussed earlier. Um, yeah, that's security. And also, what is security is the lawful and ethical use we talked about, the using of AI systems outside of your organizations or inside your organization to attack. Um, deep fakes, phishing attacks, you as a security professional need to be aware of those. So to categorize this, the whole part there those are rabbit holes, generally. I mean, they're interesting, but to you as a security professional, you should focus on the bottom left, the further attacks and the model input. And the nice thing is that you don't have to do it alone in AI. You can work with the AI engineers to help you with all those protect, uh, protections against model poisoning and uh, input attacks. There's a lot of mathematical stuff to be done there. It requires their expertise. A lot of large language model stuff. You don't have to get proficient in it. Use the AI engineers, but make them aware of these attacks and have them build these countermeasures. 
your work with your organization, of course, for governance. You want to uh, limit the impact. That's not just your responsibility because the AI can be wrong even without being hacked. So the organization needs protection against the model being wrong. You have a stake in that, but you work with the rest of the organization, with GRC and with your CTO office, basically. And you need to work with your suppliers. Many of the AI, many of the IT nowadays is with your suppliers, with your, with your, your cloud company, it's with your cloud AI provider. By understanding the threats, you can hold them, you can hold against them, uh, these, these attacks and ask them what they've done about it. So you don't have to do all these protections yourself, but you have to get the proper assurance. This is the focus on security. This is my main message. So keep calm. AI is just software, but stay alert about the things that can go wrong, including the rabbit hole things. Why am I saying this? Your voice in an organization is typically the voice about things that can go wrong. And it can be frustrating to your colleagues, right? But they appreciate it. That's your role. And it should not per se be limited to security. You have to, of course, get the security right first of AI, but stay alert about the other things that can go wrong and the world will be fine. Good luck with that. If you have any questions or remarks about it, find me later today or find me on LinkedIn. Connect with me. We'll be in touch and we'll make this AI secure. Thank you.